Welcome back. I'm Logan, your host for the Daily Bible Reading Podcast, where we are journeying through the Bible chronologically, taking it one day at a time. Today is day number 185, and we're going to be looking at 2 Kings chapters 9 through 11 today. I am glad that you are with me here. Let's pray before we get started. Today's prayer comes from the book The Valley of Vision by Arthur Bennett. It's entitled, The Great God. O fountain of all good, destroy in me every lofty thought. Break pride to pieces and scatter it to the winds. Annihilate each clinging shred of self-righteousness. Implant in me true lowliness of spirit. Abase me to self-loathing and self-abhorrence. Open in me a fount of penitential tears. Break me, then bind me up. Thus will my heart be a prepared dwelling for my God. Then can the Father take up his abode in me. Then can the blessed Jesus come with healing in his touch. Then can the Holy Spirit descend in sanctifying grace. O Holy Trinity, three persons and one God, inhabit me, a temple consecrated to thy glory. When thou art present, evil cannot abide. In thy fellowship is fullness of joy. Beneath thy smile is peace of conscience. By thy side no fears disturb, no apprehensions banish rest of mind. With thee my heart shall bloom with fragrance. Make me meet through repentance for thine indwelling. Nothing exceeds thy power. Nothing is too great for thee to do. Nothing is too good for thee to give. Infinite is thy might, boundless thy love, limitless thy grace, glorious thy saving name. Let angels sing for sinners repenting, prodigals restored, backsliders reclaimed, Satan's captives released, blind eyes opened, broken hearts bound up, the despondent cheered, the self-righteous stripped, the formalist driven from a refuge of lies, the ignorant enlightened, and saints built up in their holy faith. I ask great things of a great God. We also want to pray today for the 11,000 Kuyo peoples in China. In 1955, the Chinese government authorities ordered the Tibetan monks of the large Litang Monastery to record their possessions for tax assessment. When they refused to comply, the People's Liberation Army of China laid siege to the monastery. Upon arrival, they encountered many of the Kuyo people armed with farm equipment, to which the Chinese responded by bombing the Litang Monastery. These people live in three counties, all located in the western part of the Sichuan province. They have been officially counted as part of the Tibetan nationality. These people are committed to the Buddhist religious system, and few witnesses of Christ's grace have been there since the 1950s. It is an understatement to say that they still lack an adequate gospel witness. We pray that God would bring peace between the Chinese government and the Kuyo peoples. We pray that the Lord would call missionaries to this lone area, leading to a movement to Christ. And we pray that the Kuyo people would see the glory of the risen Jesus and turn to him alone. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, let's get started with our reading today. We're going to be catching up to where we were in Chronicles a few days ago, so don't be surprised when some of this sounds familiar. I hope you're following along. Let's get started. 2 Kings chapter 9 Then Elisha the prophet called one of the sons of the prophets and said to him, Tie up your garments and take this flask of oil in your hand and go to Ramoth Gilead. And when you arrive, look there for Jehu the son of Jehoshaphat, son of Nimshi, and go in and have him rise from among his fellows and lead him to an inner chamber. Then take the flask of oil and pour it on his head and say, 
Thus says the Lord, I anoint you king over Israel. Then open the door and flee. Do not linger. So the young man, the servant of the prophet, went to Ramoth Gilead. And when he came, behold, the commanders of the army were in council. And he said, I have a word for you, O commander. And Jehu said, To which of us all? And he said, To you, O commander. So he arose and went into the house. And the young man poured the oil on his head, saying to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anoint you king over the people of the Lord, over Israel. And you shall strike down the house of Ahab your master, so that I may avenge on Jezebel the blood of my servants the prophets, and the blood of all the servants of the Lord. For the whole house of Ahab shall perish. And I will cut off from Ahab every male, bond or free, in Israel. And I will make the house of Ahab like the house of Jeroboam the son of Naboth, and like the house of Baasha the son of Ahijah. And the dogs shall eat Jezebel in the territory of Jezreel and none shall bury her. Then he opened the door and fled. When Jehu came out to the servants of his master, they said to him, Is all well? Why did this mad fellow come to you? And he said to them, You know the fellow and his talk. And they said, That's not true. Tell us now. And he said, Thus and so he spoke to me, saying, Thus says the Lord, I anoint you king over Israel. Then, in haste, every man of them took his garment and put it under him on the bare steps. And they blew the trumpet and proclaimed, Jehu is king. Thus Jehu the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi, conspired against Joram. Now Joram, with all Israel, had been on guard at Ramoth Gilead against Hazael, king of Syria. But Joram had returned to be healed in Jezreel of the wounds that the Syrians had given him when he fought with Hazael, king of Syria. So Jehu said, If this is your decision, then let no one slip out of the city to go and tell the news in Jezreel. Then Jehu mounted his chariot and went to Jezreel, for Joram lay there, and Ahaziah king of Judah had come down to visit Joram. Now the watchman was standing on the tower in Jezreel, and he saw the company of Jehu as he came, and said, I see a company. And Joram said, Take a horseman and send to meet them, and let him say, Is it peace? So a man on horseback went to meet him and said, Thus says the king, is it peace? And Jehu said, What do you have to do with peace? Turn around and ride beside me. And the watchman reported, saying, The messenger reached them, but he is not coming back. Then he sent out a second horseman, who came to them and said, Thus the king has said, Is it peace? And Jehu answered, What have you to do with peace? Turn around and ride behind me. Again the watchman reported, He reached them, but he is not coming back. And the driving is like the driving of Jehu, the son of Nimshi, for he drives furiously. Joram said, Make ready. And they made ready his chariot. Then Joram king of Israel and Ahaziah king of Judah set out, each in his chariot, and went to meet Jehu, and met him at the property of Naboth the Jezreelite. And when Joram saw Jehu, he said, Is it peace, Jehu? He answered, What peace can there be? so long as the whorings and the sorceries of your mother Jezebel are so many. Then Joram reigned about and fled, saying to Ahaziah, Treachery, O Ahaziah! And Jehu drew his bow with his full strength, and shot Joram between the shoulders, so that the arrow pierced his heart, and he sank in his chariot. Jehu said to Bidkar his aide, Take him up and throw him on the plot of ground belonging to Naboth the Jezreelite. For remember, when you and I rode side by side behind Ahab his father, how the Lord made this pronouncement against him. As surely as I saw yesterday the blood of Naboth and the blood of his sons, declares the Lord, I will repay you on this plot of ground. Now therefore, take him up and throw him on the plot of ground in accordance with the word of the Lord. When Ahaziah the king of Judah saw this, he fled in the direction of Beth Hagan. And Jehu pursued him and said, Shoot him also. And they shot him in the chariot, at the ascent of Gur, which is by Ibleam, and he fled to Megiddo and died there. His servants carried him in a chariot to Jerusalem and buried him in his tomb with his fathers in the city of David. In the eleventh year of Joram, the son of Ahab, Ahaziah began to reign over Judah. When Jehu came to Jezreel, Jezebel heard of it, and she painted her eyes and adorned her head and looked out of the window. And as Jehu entered the gate, she said, is it peace, you Zimri, murderer of your master? And he lifted up his face to the window and said, Who is on my side? Who? 
Two or three eunuchs looked out at him. He said, throw her down. So they threw her down, and some of her blood splattered on the wall and on the horses, and they trampled on her. Then he went in and ate and drank, and he said, See now to this cursed woman and bury her, for she is a king's daughter. But when they went to bury her, they found no more of her than the skull and the feet and the palms of her hands. When they came back and told him, he said, This is the word of the Lord, which he spoke by his servant Elisha the Tishbite. In the territory of Jezreel, the dogs shall eat the flesh of Jezebel, and the corpse of Jezebel shall be as dung on the face of the field in the territory of Jezreel, so that no one can say, This is Jezebel. Chapter 10 Now Ahab had seventy sons in Samaria. So Jehu wrote letters and sent them to Samaria, to the rulers of the city, to the elders, and to the guardians of the sons of Ahab, saying, Now then, as soon as this letter comes to you, seeing your master's sons are with you, and there are with you chariots and horses, fortified cities also, and weapons, select the best and fittest of your master's sons, and set him on his father's throne, and fight for your master's house. But they were exceedingly afraid, and said, Behold, the two kings could not stand before him. How then can we stand? So he who was over the palace, and he who was over the city, together with the elders and the guardians, sent to Jehu, saying, We are your servants, and we will do all that you tell us. We will not make anyone king. Do whatever is good in your eyes. Then he wrote to them a second letter, saying, If you are on my side, and if you are ready to obey me, take the heads of your master's sons, and come to me at Jezreel tomorrow at this time. Now the king's sons, seventy persons, were with the great men of the city, who were bringing them up. And as soon as the letter came to them, they took the king's sons and slaughtered them, seventy persons, and put their heads in baskets, and sent them to him at Jezreel. When the messenger came and told him they have brought the heads of the king's sons, he said, Lay them in two heaps at the entrance of the gate until morning. Then in the morning, when he went out, he stood and said to all the people, You are innocent. It was I who conspired against my master and killed him. But who struck down all these? Know then that there shall fall to the earth nothing of the word of the Lord, which the Lord spoke concerning the house of Ahab. For the Lord has done what he has said by his servant Elijah. So Jehu struck down all who remained of the house of Ahab in Jezreel, all his men and his close friends and his priests, until he left him none remaining. Then he set out and went to Samaria. On the way, when he was at beth Echhed of the shepherds, Jehu met the relatives of Ahaziah king of Judah, and he said, Who are you? And they answered, We are the relatives of Ahaziah, and we came down to visit the royal princes and the sons of the queen mother. He said, Take them alive. And they took them alive, and slaughtered them at the pit of beth Echhed, forty-two persons, and he spared none of them. And when he departed from there, he met Jehonadab, the son of Rechab, coming to meet him. And he greeted him and said to him, Is your heart true to my heart, as mine is to yours? And Jehonadab answered, It is. And Jehu said, If it is, give me your hand. So he gave him his hand. And Jehu took him up with him into the chariot. And he said, Come with me, and see my zeal for the Lord. So he had him ride in his chariot. And when he came to Samaria, he struck down all who remained to Ahab in Samaria, till he had wiped them out, according to the word of the Lord that he spoke to Elijah. Then Jehu assembled all the people and said to them, Ahab served Baal a little, but Jehu will serve him much. Now therefore call to me all the prophets of Baal, all his worshippers and all his priests. Let none be missing, for I have a great sacrifice to offer to Baal. Whoever is missing shall not live. But Jehu did it with cunning in order to destroy the worshippers of Baal. And Jehu ordered, Sanctify a solemn assembly for Baal. So they proclaimed it. And Jehu sent throughout all Israel, and all the worshippers of Baal came, so that there was not a man left who did not come. And they entered the house of Baal, and the house of Baal was filled from one end to the other. He said to him who was in charge of the wardrobe, Bring out the vestments for all the worshippers of Baal. So he brought out the vestments for them. Then Jehu went into the house of Baal with Jehonadab the son of Rechab, and he said to the worshippers of Baal, Search, and see that there is no servant of the Lord here among you, but only the worshippers of Baal. Then they went in to offer sacrifices and burnt offerings. 
Now, Jehu had stationed eighty men outside, and said, The man who allows any of those whom I give into your hands to escape shall forfeit his life. So as soon as he had made an end of offering the burnt offering, Jehu said to the guard and to the officers, Go in and strike them down. Let not a man escape. So when they put them to the sword, the guard and the officers cast them out and went into the inner room of the house of Baal. And they brought out the pillar that was in the house of Baal and burned it. And they demolished the pillar of Baal and demolished the house of Baal and made it a latrine to this day. Thus Jehu wiped out Baal from Israel. But Jehu did not turn aside from the sins of Jeroboam the son of Naboth, which he made Israel to sin, that is, the golden calves that were in Bethel and in Dan. And the Lord said to Jehu, Because you have done well in carrying out what is right in my eyes, and have done to the house of Ahab according to all that was in my heart, your sons of the fourth generation shall sit on the throne of Israel. But Jehu was not careful to walk in the law of the Lord, the God of Israel, with all his heart. He did not turn from the sins of Jeroboam, which he made Israel to sin. In those days the Lord began to cut off parts of Israel. Hazael defeated them throughout the territory of Israel, from the Jordan eastward, all the land of Gilead, the Gadites, and the Reubenites, and the Manassites, from Aror, which is by the valley of the Arnon, that is, Gilead and Bashan. Now the rest of the acts of Jehu, and all that he did, and all his might, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Israel? So Jehu slept with his fathers, and they buried him in Samaria. And Jehoahaz, his son, reigned in his place. The time that Jehu reigned over Israel in Samaria was twenty-eight years. Chapter 11 Now when Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, she arose and destroyed all the royal family. But Jehoshaphat, the daughter of King Joram, sister of Ahaziah, took Joash, the son of Ahaziah, and stole him away from among the king's sons who were being put to death. And she put him and his nurse in a bedroom. Thus they hid him from Athaliah, so that he was not put to death. And he remained with her six years, hidden in the house of the Lord, while Athaliah reigned over the land. But in the seventh year, Jehoiada sent and brought the captains of the Karaites and of the guards, and had them come to him in the house of the Lord. And he made a covenant with them, and put them under oath in the house of the Lord. And he showed them the king's son. And he commanded them, This is the thing that you shall do. One third of you, those who come off duty on the Sabbath and guard the king's house, another third being at the gate, sir, and a third at the gate behind the guards, shall guard the palace. And the two divisions of you, which come on duty in force on the Sabbath, and guard the house of the Lord on behalf of the king, shall surround the king, each with his weapons in his hand, and whoever approaches the ranks is to be put to death. Be with the king when he goes out and when he comes in. The captains did according to all that Jehoiada the priest commanded, and they each brought his men who were to go off duty on the Sabbath, with those who were to come on duty on the Sabbath. And he came to Jehoiada the priest, and the priest gave to the captains the spears and shields that had been King David's, which were in the house of the Lord. And the guards stood, every man with his weapons in his hand, from the south side of the house to the north side of the house, around the altar, and the house on behalf of the king. Then he brought out the king's son, and put the crown on him, and gave him the testimony. And they proclaimed him king, and anointed him. And they clapped their hands, and said, Long live the king! When Athaliah heard the noise of the guard and of the people, she went into the house of the Lord to the people. And when she looked, there was the king standing by the pillar, according to the custom, and the captains and the trumpeters beside the king, and all the people of the land rejoicing and blowing trumpets. And Athaliah tore her clothes and cried, Treason! Treason! Then Jehoiada the priest commanded the captains who were set over the army, Bring her out between the ranks, and put to death with the sword anyone who follows her. For the priest said, Let her not be put to death in the house of the Lord. So they laid hands on her, and she went through the horse's entrance to the king's house, and there she was put to death. And Jehoiada made a covenant between the Lord and the king and people, that they should be the Lord's people, and also between the king and the people. Then all the people of the land went to the house of Baal and tore it down. His altars and his images they broke in pieces, and they killed Matan the priest of Baal before the altars. And the priest 
posted watchmen over the house of the Lord. And he took the captains, the Karaites, the guards, and all the people of the land, and they brought the king down from the house of the Lord, marching through the gate of the guards to the king's house. And he took his seat on the throne of the kings. So all the people of the land rejoiced, and the city was quiet after Athaliah had been put to death with the sword at the king's house. Jehoash was seven years old when he began to reign. If you're looking for encouragement for life's journey, a better understanding of the Bible, or an honest look at Scripture, check out the Christ-Centered Journey. I'm your host, Dan Shipton, and I'd like to invite you to check us out. Mondays through Fridays, we air new programs. It's a daily podcast that's built around building one another up as Christ followers in this journey we call life. So why don't you join us by looking us up on your podcasting host for the Christ-Centered Journey. The largest part of our reading today is about the fulfillment of Elijah's prophecy against the house of Ahab. If you remember back to 1 Kings chapter 19, while Elijah was fleeing from Jezebel, he went to Mount Horeb, also known as Mount Sinai, and God spoke to Elijah and comforted him, and he told him there to anoint three people, Elisha as a prophet in his place, Hazael over Syria, which we saw fulfilled yesterday, and Jehu over Israel. Now, it could be easy to forget this. I mean, Ahab has been dead for 12 years at this point. But his influence is still felt in massive ways as his sons and other relatives have been ruling and Jezebel is still living in that summer palace with the vineyard stolen from Naboth in Jezreel and she is pulling her strings and exerting her evil influence as a Baal worshiper. Well, those days are coming to an end, and justice will be done. For some reason that we're not given, Elisha chose to send the message of anointing to Jehu using one of the prophets in training. Now Jehu is the captain of the army, and Israel's army is up fighting against Syria in Ramoth Gilead, and that's where the current king, Jehoram of Israel, was wounded. The king had left and gone to Jezreel to be nursed back to health by mommy, and Ahaziah came up from Jerusalem to visit Jehoram, who was his uncle, along with Jezebel, his grandmother. Well, after Jehu gets the word from the prophet, it seems like he just leaves the fighting in Ramoth Gilead, which we subsequently find out in chapter 10, verse 32, that during Jehu's reign, they lost all the territory on the east side of the Jordan River because God was cutting them off. Although Jehu was doing the will of God and taking care of the former sins of Ahab, he had his own sins, and he was perpetuating these sins to the rest of Israel. Now, some people have trouble with the level of violence that we see in these chapters. There are wholesale slaughters of over a hundred in Ahab's family and cohort, and countless numbers of Baal worshippers. On the other hand, if you've read this story before, it can be kind of easy to just let those details roll past you and not really consider how violent it is. So I want to address this quickly, because the obvious question that most people ask is, how could God allow such violence to be carried out in his name? And the standard answer that you will hear is that they all deserved it because of their idolatry and their connection to the wickedness of Ahab, and if they are allowed to continue, then their idolatry will continue to pollute the land. And that's not incorrect. God had foretold all of these things, and God could have caused a chasm to open up and make the earth swallow them whole. But in this case, he chose to use a political rival. Now, I don't think for a moment that after Jehu was anointed as king, he somehow was transformed into, you know, the godly man on the scene, any more than Sennacherib of Assyria or Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon are going to see themselves as doing Yahweh's will when they come and take over Israel and Judah, respectively. Jehu does make reference to the prophecies against Ahab and Jezebel, 
as a justification for his actions and to solidify his support around this campaign. He promises to purify Israel of anything that smelled of Ahab and Jezebel. It was time for a fresh start, and Jehu has the military power and the political will to see these things through, and God uses this to accomplish his will. And Jehu is efficient, and he's clever in the way that he takes out the current kings and the rest of Ahab's descendants, as well as Jezebel and the worshippers of Baal. These deaths were all deserved. There was none among them that were innocent. If God had consumed them with a plague or taken each of them out with their own lightning bolt, it would have made things a bit more clear possibly, but recognize that there would still be some that want to imagine that God didn't sanction these events, but that they were just the violent actions of a violent man. However, don't think for a moment that somehow God has changed from the time of Jehu. The same God that spoke through the mouths of the prophets and called for the wholesale slaughter of faithless peoples is still the same God of the New Testament and the same God that shows mercy and forgiveness and grace in the New Testament is still the same God of the Old Testament. You see, God doesn't have moods. It's not like he feels like being angry at one moment and loving the next. God is love, and an extension of that love is wrath. Now let me explain. God loves the one thing that is worthy of his affection above all things. That is his glory. God is passionate for his glory. Now that might sound selfish, but God is not an idolater. The first commandment, that God is the Lord and you should have none before him, is the first one because it coordinates with God's own assessment of the universe and his own nature. And really, whose assessment of reality could be more reliable than God's? So God gets to set the rules for the universe that he created and for the people that he created. And he essentially said, love me and worship me alone and show that love to others in your lives. That's the summation of the law. But none of us do that. We all fail to uphold God as the greatest thing in the universe. And this is an unacceptable divine insult. God has decreed that anyone who can't recognize that is not worthy of breathing. Why? Because he loves his glory so much that it leads to wrath against those that insult it. Now, you might be able to feel this if you imagine the person here on earth that you love the most. Maybe your mother, or your wife, or your children. And now, imagine someone threatening them, insulting them, and violating them. Does that make your blood boil just a little? Would you be willing to do violence to protect the thing that you love? I bet you would. That sense of love and justice and value and wrath all comes from being made in God's image. So, what's the difference? Why do things seem so different from the Old Testament to the New? Well, in a word, Jesus now, you see, back in the Old Testament, it's declared that man cannot do what God has asked them to do. The perfect plan that God set out for them is just impossible to achieve. None fulfill it. So, in places like Deuteronomy chapter 18, and Jeremiah chapter 31, and Ezekiel chapter 36, God lays out a plan that we call the New Covenant. Now, covenant's just like a deal. And in this new covenant, God says that he is going to do everything necessary to make us his. Now, why does he want to do this? To the praise of his glorious grace. It's not for anything in us. Again, it's all about him. So Jesus came 
and he was the only human to never sin. He perfectly upheld God's glory from the womb to the tomb. However, when he died, he was subjected to the full fury of the wrath of God. Now, you might decry, that doesn't sound fair. He didn't do anything wrong. And you would be absolutely right. Let me just make this clear. No one ever said that salvation is fair. It is God's grace. Fair would mean that we would all end up getting eaten by dogs like Jezebel. That is justice. But the cross of Jesus Christ magnified and focused God's wrath on Jesus instead of it being against each person in their sin. God, essentially, in Christ, built an ark of safety through the flood of his wrath for those that are in Jesus. So, here's the picture today. We all stand condemned before a holy God, and there will be a day of wrath, much like there was a day of wrath foretold for Ahab's descendants. And during this life, there are two options. Those that turn to God in Christ and accept his death on their behalf get life. And those that don't remain under the wrath of God, and they will receive it in its full force without end. Now, that should be a scary thought if you don't know Jesus. Like the writer of Hebrews says, it is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. You don't want to be consigned to outer darkness. So as we close today, I I do want to look at God's assessment of Jehu's actions to see if he was doing the right thing according to God. In chapter 10, verse 30 and 31, it says, And the Lord said to Jehu, this is God's word to Jehu, Because you have done well in carrying out what is right in my eyes and have done to the house of Ahab according to all that was in my heart, your sons of the fourth generation shall sit on the throne of Israel. So it sounds there like God is happy with what Jehu has done. However, the inspired author in the next verse says this, But Jehu was not careful to walk in the law of the Lord, the God of Israel, with all his heart. He did not turn from the sins of Jeroboam, which he made Israel to sin. So God was pleased with what Jehu had done to Ahab's house, but God was not completely satisfied with Jehu because his heart was not fully in line with God's heart. Also, a quick note about Ahab's house. As we see in chapter 11, Jehu had not made a complete end of Ahab's house. Athaliah, who was Ahab's daughter, remained on the throne of Judah for seven years after Jehu put that arrow through her son Ahaziah. However, God brought another event to pass that brought her to an end and elevated a son who was born into this sinful family to do what was right in the eyes of God. But Jehu's heart was not wholly devoted to the Lord. He continued to allow the worship of the golden calves of Jeroboam. So it sounds like God could have handled a little more violence than even that which Jehu offered. But what God really wanted was Jehu's heart. That's what he wants from all of us. He wants a heart submitted to him. He can do great things with that, even if it isn't perfect. That's what Jesus does. He covers our sins, and he allows us, even as sinners, to be reconciled to God. Then, in union with God, through the Holy Spirit, we begin to live transformed lives. Not perfect lives, We'll still rely on the grace and the sacrifice of Jesus until the day we die. But we are daily being transformed from one degree of glory to the next until we breathe our last or until he calls us home. And then he will finally purify us from all traces of sin and the flesh. And we will be made new and holy in his sight. That's the good news of the gospel. And it's not just something for unbelievers to hear. I know that many of you heard this and you're going, I've heard the gospel before. I'm already a Christian. (laughs) Well, we need to hear this good news 
even as believers, and continue to be transformed by it day by day as we deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow him. Thank you for joining me today. I hope this has been encouraging to you. If so, please let me know by visiting the links that you find under the Connect With Us section in the show notes. I'm a simple man and I could use the encouragement. If you've been blessed enough that you would like to support the podcast, I would greatly appreciate that as well. You can go to buymeacoffee.com slash dbrpodcast to make either a one-time gift or to sign up for a monthly recurring membership gift. Until tomorrow, keep reading and keep worshiping.